Joining us now for the second of five consecutive nights here on the agenda all week long, Jeremy Rivkin from the Foundation on Economic Trends. His latest book is called The Empathic Civilization. We talk the promise and problems of progress all week here on the agenda. Nice to see you again. Nice to be here. Okay. Yesterday we talked about the origins of progress, and now tonight we're going to move into the more technological era. So how, let's just for starters, get our good definitions in place again. How are you defining this era? Well, again, uh, progress is a way of defining the meaning of the human journey and uh, why we think we're here. Relatively new idea. Uh, the key here is whenever we take a look at how we define the human journey, it, it, it's always about changing our, our consciousness, our way of thinking about the world. It, it, we have, in various periods of history, consciousness changes. Our actual feelings about who we are, why we're here, they change. We don't think the way a medieval serf thought mm -hmm. or a forager or hunter 30,000 years ago. And it changes when energy and communication revolutions come together. When they come together, they change the way we understand the reality around us. So in the 19th century, we had this print technology revolution coming together with coal and steam power to manage the first industrial revolution. We started to find the idea of progress appealing. We were create, accumulating a lot of wealth. Uh, we were becoming efficient. We were becoming productive. And that's what the industrial revolution is about, being industrious. So if you were industrious, you were always improving your calling and, uh, and, uh, and creating heaven on earth. The idea is we don't have to wait for salvation in the next world. We're going to create our own heaven on earth through a material cornucopia. That was the first industrial revolution. And uh, a whole generation learned to be productive, productive, productive. The 20th century, a big switch happened in our notion of progress. Really a, a, a tremendous transition. We went to the second industrial revolution. And again, there was another convergence of communication energy which changed the wiring of the human brain. We had first generation electricity communication, the telegraph and telephone, and then cinema and radio, later television. That communication revolution converged with a new energy regime, oil, and the internal combustion engine, and the auto age. And so when that new communication revolution converged with that new energy revolution, our thinking changed from ideological consciousness, the 19th century, to psychological consciousness, the 20th century. So today, we think psychologically. We take that for granted. Grandma and Grandpa couldn't think psychologically uh, at all in my grandparents' generation. For example, if, if we were at a family dinner and my grandmother, I could watch her at the dinner and she's becoming increasingly quiet and I can see that she's stressed out and when no one's looking, she throws a plate on the floor to get attention and I say to Grandma, Grandma, I saw that. That was not an accident. That was obviously a passive aggressive act. <laughs> you obviously, let's think about this for a moment, was there something when you were growing up at family dinners, something in your childhood experience that you were now acting out again and projecting uh, deep inside of you? Now, Grandma would not have a clue of what I'm asking her to do because she can't think th psychologically or therapeutically. Uh, every kid can today. They know about introspection and projection and transference, et cetera. Maybe not by those words, but they, not get, by those they words. get the concept. Grandma could think ideologically. She could even think theologically, religiously. Sure. She could think mythologically, knock on wood, salt over the shoulder. But she wasn't prepared to think psychologically. When, uh, so we've had these changes in consciousness over history. Mythological consciousness, no progress, eternal return. You do the same thing season after season, century after century, because you're moving with the migratory patterns uh, and the seasonal changes. Then we had great theological consciousness when we created the great agricultural civilizations. We started to think religiously. No progress, but at least salvation in the next world. We get to the first industrial revolution. We start to think ideologically. Maybe we can create our own cornucopia on earth. We become uh, wealthier, and therefore we think we're making progress, quote unquote, new idea. But the 20th century, when we went from ideological to psychological consciousness, all of a sudden there was a new idea of progress. Not personal accumulation of wealth, not efficiency, not productivity, but self-fulfillment. And what brought that on? Well, you know, it's very interesting what brought it on. I think electricity played a very big role here. When electricity communication came in to organize the internal combustion engine, it annihilated time and space. We began to, uh, and electricity was used by the early psychologists as a metaphor for life because electricity is neither material or immaterial. It's a force you can feel, but it's more like what the brain does. You, you can feel what the brain does, but you can't actually 
see that electricity in the brain connecting. So, so what happened is electricity became a new metaphor. In the 18th and 19th century, when we were working with just plain old machines, we created mechanical metaphors. So we began to see the universe as a clockwork universe, a great machine that wound up the universe, and we're all parts, clogs in that machine. So the Enlightenment philosophers kind of used mechanical metaphors to redefine uh, human nature and the human journey. That's why we became in love with efficiency. That's a machine value. So then we became efficient just like the machines. Uh, in the 20th century, though, electricity gave us this new metaphor because with electricity, everything's connected. It's a field. And we began to uh, think in different ways. Uh, psychological consciousness were very interesting. It, it really blossomed in the 1960s uh, with the, uh, the uh, uh, encounter groups and uh, the sensitivity seminars and the self-help groups like Al Alcoholics Anonymous. We take all that for granted, but imagine what a big deal it was all of a sudden in the 1950s and especially the 60s when anonymous people would get together in a room, maybe 100 people, and start talking about their deepest feelings with each other. Your grandmother would have thought that oh was nuts. Oh, my gosh. I, they, they would never have done this. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk much. <laughs> But you, you sort of had to kind of intuit what they were thinking because they didn't even know how to express their feelings. They weren't therapeutic in their thinking. But try to imagine the 60s, all of a sudden in big rooms, hundreds of people talking in tea groups and encounter groups about how they feel about each other, themselves. This was amazing. This had never happened before in and history. you think electricity was one of the things that prompted that? Absolutely, because it created a new set of metaphors for how people could connect. With psychology, everything's interconnected at the same time. There's no me and you. We're all part of a common field of experience. So Exemplified, uh, I guess, through radio and television programming. And absolutely, that kind of and uh, yeah. that allowed us to begin introspection as well. So uh, uh, if someone had come back <laughs> from medieval life, or let's say in the 16th century, and saw 200 people in a room talking about their deepest feelings and, and, and actually questioning other people's deeper, deepest feelings in a therapeutic setting or on a psychiatric couch or in a group therapy, they would have thought this is the strangest experience they ever <laughs> saw. But what it did is it fashioned a generation to start rethinking progress. Because once we start looking inside, we ask, well, what is my life about? Hmm. Why am I here? Well, let me put two things on the table then that may have advanced that agenda even further. And, and I did not know this statistic until I read it in your book. And it would not even, who would even know where to begin to think about this? A at any time of day, there are apparently, you tell us, 49,000 planes in the sky around this planet. The plane, how did that add to all of the, the, our understanding of progress in the, in the last century? Well, we started to realize that we're interconnected. And this is really moving now very quickly in the 21st century. We started to shrink time and space again. Again, when energy and communication revolutions come together, they annihilate time and space. So therefore, when you change your temporal spatial orientation, the mind has to rethink reality in different ways. If you're, in a, if, you're a, if you're in a forest, cocooned in a forest 50,000 years ago, you don't even have a panoramic view. There's no open fields. Mm -hmm. So you're just looking straight up in the trees and straight down. Your temporal spatial orientation is each day you're foraging and hunting, and there is no surplus, there's no wealth. So your whole sense of time and space is different. When you go to a great agricultural civilization and, and you start tending vegetables and you start pastoral pastoring animals, you start having a sense of history of something that unfolds over time. You see the animals get old, they have, they have birth, you have to take care of them. Each year you have to tend the vegetables in the garden. So your temporal spatial orientation changes and you, as you get rid of all those forests, you start to begin to see landscapes. No forest, instead of looking up and down, you start looking out. You start to have more of a linear perspective, all right? Uh, Take a look, for example, at the great cathedrals, if you want to see how consciousness and our ideas change. Sometimes Americans, Canadians, and U.S. will go to Europe and we'll look at the cathedrals. We'll try to take a photograph of them from the outside, and we'll say, you know what? We can't get a photograph because there's too much surrounding the cathedral. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they create it so that you could get a panoramic view? Well, that wasn't the way people viewed reality. Everything was clustered back then in a feudal society. The idea is you walk into the cathedral and you look up to heaven. Mm -hmm. You look up, not out. In the industrial age, as we developed the railroads, the railroads were across open spaces. 
we began to look at landscapes. We began to change our spatial temporal orientation, and we began to think of linear progress. Each day, we can see further ahead, and as we see the future, we can start to fill it, fill it in. How do you fill in the future with an idea called progress when you're in a forest? Mm -hmm. All right? So what I'm saying over history, the shift from mythological consciousness to theological to ideological to psychological has to do with our changing ways we organize our Earth, and our energy of the Earth, the way we communicate, and that changes our temporal spatial orientation fundamentally. It changes our idea of what the human journey is about. Which the airplane would have just exploded. The airplane and cinema and radio and television and the, and the telephone Can't and the, the automobile yeah. that all connected us and we started to think of progress not so much just in terms of material gain but more in terms of communities. As we started to come together we started to move beyond the little xenophobia of the little village we lived in and we began to live in big cities and in the suburbs and we started to think more in terms of our relationship to each other. Not just through blood ties, but our relationship to each other as human beings living uh, together in, in one big world. Okay, let me finish up on th this then tonight, and that is, that all sounds great, but of course we know there was a huge cost associated with all of that as well. Can you go into some of that? Well, the cost is enormous, and it, it, may, be, it may be our death knell. And that is that throughout history, as we brought uh, new energy re revolutions into place and we created new sophisticated ways of communicating to manage large numbers of people, uh, we did change consciousness. We did expand our ability uh, to be uh, a human race, but we created bigger and bigger entropy bills. Today, we're in a globally connected civilization. I mean, we are connected through our communications and technology, uh, but the same civilizations that allowed us to connect the human race in very, very intimate ways as using up so much of the energy of the resources of the Earth that we're facing potential extinction now, mm -hmm. according to our scientists, with climate change. So look at the industrial age. Uh, th the great bonus is we dug up the Jurassic burial grounds, took all that carbon, we burned it, and turned it into one of the great civilizations in history. It's all made out of carbon. Everything here, all our construction materials are made of fossil fuels. All of our pharmaceutical products, most of our clothes, our pesticides and fertilizers for agriculture, our packaging materials. It's all made out of the burial grounds of the Jurassic Age. So we dug it up, we created this huge civilization, and we created a lot of wealth for a small part of the human race. Not everybody. But now the bill is in, it's called spent CO2. After 200 years of using up this carbon, we have so much CO2, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that our climate is radically changing, fundamentally changing. And our scientists say that we may be within the last century of life as we know it on this planet. We could actually be facing extinction sometime over the next three, four, or five generations if our scientists are right. So we're sleepwalking here. We're kind of sleepwalking our way into our possible extinction. So we really have to take a look at how we define progress, how we define the good life. Uh, what is the meaning of the human journey? Do we have a responsibility to future generations to get it right and re-steward the planet? Let me give you one example. And every viewer will, will remember this the rest of their life. I teach at the Wharton School. It's the oldest business school in the world. I teach CEOs. They come back when they're in their 40s. They suffer through six weeks of, my, of courses. The first thing I tell them is the basic economy is photosynthesis. Everything we do relies on that. Everything you do relies on photosynthesis. Now, here's the problem. We humans are the, are the youngest species on the planet. We've only been here about 175,000 years anatomically modern humans. We're the babies. We only represent one half of one percent of the living biomass of this planet. One half of one percent. And yet we dominate. We're using 24 percent of the photosynthesis of this earth and we're going from 6.8 to 9, 10 billion people by 2050, meaning we're going to use over half the photosynthesis even though we'll still be only one percent of the biomass. We are devouring the earth in our lifetime. It's, we're monsters. So what we have to do is we're going to have to rethink our notion of progress quickly. We're going to have to rethink human nature and the meaning of the human journey, or we may face the prospect that the youngest species on this in the neighborhood, us, we may not be here long. That is a perfect cliffhanger to end today's program and to set us up for the discussion that we're going to have tomorrow. Jeremy Rifkin, as always, thanks so much. Thanks.